last talk is by Bernd Ulrich. It's a very important one at the conference. He's telling us about the mathematical contributions of Craig Hunneke. Of course, those contributions are too vast to manage in one talk, but he's giving us a sampler. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Srinivas, for the introduction. And also, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity here to talk about Craig's work. Uh, of course, it is a challenge, as he said, because uh, there's so much of it. And to uh, make a selection is difficult, so it really is just a sample. Okay? Um, I also want to uh, say on a personal note, I've met Craig for the first time over 41 years ago at a snowed in winter meeting of the AMS in Cincinnati. And then in the following fall, Craig joined Purdue University as a faculty member where I was a postdoc at the time. So, and that's when we started working and this was the beginning of a long lasting collaboration and friendship. Uh, and I've always uh, thought of Craig very much as an older brother uh, although he's not so much older than me. Uh, but uh, it is, even if we don't meet for a long time, there's always an immediate connection mathematically and otherwise. So it's always great to be with him. Of course, Craig, Craig has had a tremendous influence on the field and the people working in the field. Uh, he has been a big supporter of young people and um, he has helped all of us through his work, of course, but also through uh, the many questions he asked and the problems he shared very generously. And he certainly has changed the face of commutative algebra. There are lots of new developments where he was at the very beginning and initiated them or he built the ground floor on which other people then could keep constructing theorems and new theories. So this is a, a great contribution and we all have to be very grateful to him. Uh, of course, it's sad that Mel cannot be here, even I think uh, virtually he won't be here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this talk I'm giving is also very much inspired by a joint talk and a joint paper we wrote, Mel and I, about Craig's work uh, at the occasion of his 65th birthday. So, uh, so somehow he is there at least. Um, so let me start. So again, uh, this is a sampler, not more than a sampler. Uh, I'm talking about some themes uh, of Craig's work. Um, one of the themes is um, uh, asymptotic behavior of ideals, um, and that includes restrings, integral closures, symbolic powers, but also linkage, residual intersections, and similar things. I also talk about uniformity, which is a big theme in his work, and according to him, it's a, it's a very big thing in commutative algebra, but certainly it is a big theme in his work. Um, I also talk about local cohomology and R+. Plus. Okay, I won't touch tight closure because Irena Swanson will talk about that on Thursday. So that's the work of Craig and Unique and, and Craig and Mel about tight closure. Okay, so I'm sparing that out completely. Okay, um, so let's start then. Um, so since Hilbert functions and multiplicities were introduced, the behavior of powers of ideals has been an important topic in commutative algebra. This has led to the study of restrings, associated graded rings, and the relationship between powers and symbolic powers, for instance. Okay. And Craig already in his thesis uh, written basically under the supervision of David Eisenbart, um, came up with Im an Im very important notion uh, in this area, that's the notion of D-sequences. So what's a D-sequence? Going the wrong way. What's a D-sequence? A uh, D-sequence is a vast generalization of a regular sequence. So let's uh, take n elements A1 up to An in a Noetherian ring. Noetherian is not so important here and I, the ideal they generate, then these, for, these ideals form a D-sequence if the following is true. Well, what does regular sequence mean? It means that if one colons an element into the ideal generated by the previous elements, you would get the ideal generated by the previous elements. Now, D-sequence is the same, but you have to also intersect with the ideal generated by the whole sequence. So this is a much weaker condition, of course, and it is uh, satisfied in many instances, and that's one of the things Craig showed. Um, and one of the applications of these sequences is the following 
theorem except the theorem doesn't want to come. <laughs> Sometimes they don't, yes, too. <laughs> it's stuck. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, ah, there it is, okay, no? That's it, that's it, okay. So that's a theorem that was proved independently by Craig and by Tito Valla, and it says that if you have an ideal generated by a D sequence, then the natural map from the symmetric algebra onto the Ries algebra is an isomorphism, okay? And this is the first uh, big result in this direction. Before this was known for regular sequences and so on, this, which is quite, quite not so interesting. Uh, and why is that interesting? Well, it has for two reasons. First of all, if the symmetric algebra is a Ries algebra, then one has control over the associated primes of the symmetric algebra, which are usually a mess. So because the Ries algebra is torsion-free over R, the symmetric algebra is not in general. And on the other hand, uh, for the Ries algebra, it has the benefit that one knows the defining equations of the Ries algebra because one knows the defining equations of the symmetric algebra, and that is a classical problem in elimination theory. So that's one of the advantages, and this is already a very important result. Um, now, remember, uh, regular sequences can be characterized in terms of the acyclicity of the Kozul complex. And there is a similar characterization for D sequences. They can be characterized, characterized in terms of the acyclicity of another complex, which is called the M complex. And that complex was introduced by Herzog, Siemens, and Vasconcelos. And what it is is the following. I quickly want to uh, mention the construction. So we start again with these elements in a Neuthian ring. I is the ideal they generate. And then we look at the homology of the Kozul complex on these elements. Okay, so that's a graded module if you want. And then one can uh, construct a complex called the approximation complex. And what it is, is you take H and tensor it with a polynomial in N new variables, as many variables as there are generators of the idea. And the differential is the Kozul differential, but not the Kozul differential on the A's. That would just be zero because I've taken the homology of the Kozul complex, rather one takes the Kozul differential on the T's, on these new variables, okay? And that's a, a bounded complex, um, and it turns out that it's zero's homology is always the symmetric algebra of I mod I squared, okay? Which maps onto the associate graded ring. So that's sort of the same picture we had before, the symmetric algebra mapping on the least ring, just the same picture, but tensored with R mod I. So that's what this gives us. And it turns out, and that was proved by Herzog, Siemens, Vasconcelos, that if a ring is local with infinite residue field, then the acyclicity of the M complex is equivalent to the fact that I is generated by a D sequence. So this is a characterization, not of D sequence, but of ideals generated by D sequence. There's a difference, of course. Uh, so that's the homological characterization of D sequences, and that connects this notion of D sequence to homological algebra, okay, which can be used very effectively. And for instance, they prove also that if R is a Macaulay ring and the height of I is positive, and two important conditions are satisfied, and they will appear over and over again in this talk. The first is the strong Macaulayness. I is strongly called Macaulay, is the, if the Kozul homology is a core Macaulay model, automatically a maximal core Macaulay R model. It's called strongly core Macaulay because R mod I is H0. So strongly core Macaulay in particular implies that R mod I is core Macaulay, but it's much stronger, of course. And the second condition, that's a simpler condition. It's a condition on the local number of generators of the idea. It simply says that locally at each prime, the number of generators of the ideal is at most as big as the dimension of the ambient ring. Okay. So that's a much weaker than being a complete intersection locally. So it's a sliding condition, and that can be easily checked in terms of height of fitting ideals. And what this does for you is that the strongly Kolmikoliness tells you that the M complex is a bounded complex of maximal Kolmikoli models. 
And this other condition tells you that locally, since the number of generators is small, the M complex can be replaced by a complex of a very short length. And these two facts together with the acyclicity lemma imply immediately that the M complex is acyclic. So this is a sufficient condition for acyclicity of the M complex. And once you have the M complex is acyclic, uh, then one can show in general if the M complex is acyclic, then this map up there uh, from the symmetric algebra of Imod I squared onto the associated credit ring is actually an isomorphism. And that isomorphism, again, by work of Valla lifts to an isomorphism between the symmetric algebra and the associated credit ring. That's one way to see it. So acyclicity implies this isomorphism. And then uh, the comicaliness of um, this associated credit ring, for instance, follows because now the M complex is an acyclic complex and all the models there are maximum Kolmikoli models. Therefore, by the depth lemma, this associated credit ring is Kolmikoli. And then, for instance, uh, by work of Chungi Keda, the Ries ring also has to be Kolmikoli. So that's one way to say it. So this is really all one wants in some sense. It's very important to know that these algebras, the Ries ring and the associated credit ring, are Kolmikoli. And it's also very important to know that the Ries ring is isomorphic to the symmetric algebra. So this is somehow the desired result. Of course, there are drawbacks. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Okay? Now, Craig proved similar results, not using this homological machinery, but using what he calls Macaulay D sequences. But he came up with, with very similar results, okay? with different methods. Okay? Um, now, the question is, uh, the condition here, as I said, there are two conditions. One is sort of harmless, this condition on the local number of generators. The other is a subtle condition, strong Kolmikolness. And then the condition, the question is, which ideas are strongly Kolmikolness? How do you check? Do you have good examples? And this is where Craig comes in again. Uh, and this is where linkage comes in. So when are ideals strongly Kolmikolly? And this leads to the notion of linkage. Uh, linkage or liaison has been used since the 19th century as a method for classifying projective varieties, in particular curves in P3, and then names are Max Noether, Cayley, Halfen, Gaeta, and many others. Um, and here's a definition. Suppose R is a Kolmikolly ring, and I and K are proper ideals. Then these ideals are linked. And that's uh, the symbol one uses. Um, if there exists a regular sequence, which has the property that K is the colon ideal alpha colon I, and for symmetry, I is the colon ideal alpha colon K. Okay. And from this definition, it follows immediately that alpha is in the intersection of I and K, and also uh, that I and K both are a mix of the same co-dimension G. Okay. So, and this relation is symmetric, but it's not reflexive or transitive, and therefore one passes to what's called the linkage class, the equivalence relation generated by this. Uh, two ideals are in the same linkage class or the same even linkage class. If for some n or some even n, I can be linked to k by a finite sequence of links, n of them. Okay? And one says, that's a particularly interesting case that I is Leachy if it is in the linkage class of a complete intersection. So the Leachy ideals are those which you can get from a complete intersection via iterated linkage. Okay? And that's an important class um, because these ideals can be arbitrarily complicated. On the other hand, they are somewhat well behaved. They still remember that they come from a complete intersection a long time ago. So that's, that's the advantage. And <clears throat> here are some examples. Perfect ideals of high two are Leachy. This is basically the content of some of this classical work. Of course, they were talking about cur curves in P3. But, and then the, the, the condition is that these curves are automatically call if and only if they are Leachy. The same works for perfect ideals which are Gornstein of high three. And, but it also works for other types of ideals. For instance, uh, this ideal here, which is generated by the minus, maximum minus of a generic matrix together with the entries of this product. So uh, 
uh, a vector times a matrix. So this is a, a baby case of a variety of complexes. And this is also linkage. This ideal is also the defining ideal, by the way, of the associate credit ring of a generic perfect ideal of phi 2. And those are examples of linkage. Leach ideals are many more in constructions how to get new Leach ideals from old ones. But here is the theorem of Unicke. This is an amazing and uh, very interesting result. And it's really one of the first results that prove uh, really non-trivial non properties of Leach ideals. And it says that if we are in a Cormacaulay ring, and I and K are ideals in the same even linkage class. Even is important. Yeah, even is closer than odd, okay? because each ideal is evenly linked to itself, but it's oddly linked to something totally different, possibly. Uh, <clears throat> so then I is strongly called Macaulay if and only if K is. So strong core is an invariant of the even linkage class. And in particular, since every complete intersection is strongly called Macaulay and every complete intersection is linked to itself, so even odd doesn't make a difference, it follows that every Leach ideal is strongly called Macaulay. So all these ideals I mentioned before, they all, satisfies, they all satisfy the assumptions in that theorem about associate credit rings and trees rings. So that's a, a very, very beautiful result and an interesting result. Uh, then, in joint work, we went on to study Leach ideals, and not only Leach ideals, to study other properties that are invariant under linkage in some sense. And uh, one of those properties are the graded shifts in a minimal free resolution. So now take a homogeneous ideal, which is perfect, call it I prime, in a polynomial ring, look at the minimal homogeneous resolution of this idea, sorry, uh, of this, what happened? Wrong button, okay, as usual. Uh, uh, we look at the minimal free resolution of this idea. It, the resolution before the perfection has length g minus one, where g is the co-dimension of the idea, and now localized at the homogeneous maximum idea. And the statement is, if the maximum of the last shift is at most the length of the resolution times the minimum of the first shift, so in other words, if the uh, shifts don't go very fast, uh, then for every idea in the linkage class of I, even after localizing, and these ideals, of course, need not be coming from homogeneous ideal anymore. Any ideal, even this localized thing, one can say that the number of generators of this new ideal cannot be smaller than the number of channels of I, and the type of R mod K cannot be smaller than the type of R mod I. So in other words, no matter what you do, you can never improve the ideal by even linkage if this particular condition is satisfied. In particular, I cannot be Leachy, because if that condition is satisfied, then I would have to be a complete intersection, but complete intersections are ruled out by these numerical so such an idea can never be Leachy. One should think of this as a negative result in some sense, a, con a criterion, a necessary condition for being Leachy. So one can use that to show something is not Leachy, and one can use it also to distinguish linkage classes. Okay? And <clears throat> in particular, uh, one can get from this quite easily uh, the following, where we had seen already that there's only one linkage class of arithmetically called Macaulay curves in P3, and this was known classically, not in this language, but this was known in the 19th century already, and also of arithmetically Gornstein curves in P4, but using this previous result, one can easily show that there are infinitely many, even smooth, arithmetically called Macaulay curves in P4, or arithmetically Gornstein curves in P5, that belong to different linkage classes. So the Condition, the behavior is completely wild if you step up one dimension. And in fact, these uh, various uh, linked curves, they can even be obtained from each other by a linear automorphism of the projective space. So this way, linkage is, is very, very fine. Um, because linkage is very fine, one wants to look at a more general notion, and that's a notion of residual intersection. Okay. And residual intersection is similar to linkage, except that the two, so to speak, linked ideals need not have the same height. So you can uh, have different ideals connected to each other. Otherwise, the definition is similar. Um, so R, again, is a Neuthian ring. I is an ideal of height G. S is an integer at least G. 
Um, and then one considers a proper ideal K, and such a proper ideal is an S, the serial intersection was to, needs to keep track of this S of I if K is a colon ideal, J colon I, for some S generated ideal J inside I, and the height is at least S. So the crucial uh, point here, the, the crucial condition that makes this somewhat strong and rigid uh, is that the number of generators of the ideal one colons into is less or equal to the height of the colon. Okay? Uh, you may be tempted to think that S is the largest possible height of this colon, but that's not true. There is no colon altitude theorem for colon ideals. In fact, this height can be arbitrarily large. Uh, and it's actually interesting when the height cannot be arbitrarily large or what the height is because that's related to integral dependence of ideals. It's also related to dimensions of sequence varieties and so on. So there are various interesting connections to that. Um, now assume, for instance, that I is Gornstein and I is unmixed. Then it's easy to see that G residual intersection, so the case where S is smallest possible, namely G, the height of the ideal, is simply linked. So this is a vast generalization of linkage. Um, but notice the situation is very different because if two ideals are linked and if you are in a Gornstein ring, then R mod, and if R mod I is Cormicoli, then also the link is Cormicoli. That's a result proved by Peskin and Spiro. So the, in modern algebraic language, language they, they reworked the, the classical theory of linkage in modern algebraic language, and that's what they proved. Okay? They also observed that this is not true if the ambient ring is only Cormicoli. So it doesn't work in a Cormicoli ring. And then uh, the crucial observation of Craig was that if you're in a Cormicoli ring and you strengthen the condition of being Cormicoli to being strongly Cormicoli, then indeed the link is Cormicoli. Okay? Uh, that's a very crucial observation because of the following. Uh, it's, it allowed him to prove a theorem, which is a very surprising theorem, because in general, it's, it's a theorem about residual intersection. Of course, in general, residual intersections, no matter if your ideal is called Macaulay, residual intersection need not be called Macaulay anymore. They can be badly, badly mixed, and, and all kinds of strange things can happen. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he can show the following. If we are in a called Macaulay ring, I is an ideal, and S is an S residual intersection, so that familiar conditions. First of all, I is strongly called Macaulay, and second, this G condition on the number of generators, except now it's not G infinity, it's only what's called GS, which means it's like G infinity, but you don't require it for all prime ideals. You only require this for prime ideals up to height S minus one. So in particular, if S is at most the dimension of the ring, you never say anything about the global number of generators of the ideal. So this is a weaker condition, what we have seen before. But then he shows that in this case, indeed, the height of K cannot be bigger than S. So this is a cool intersection, cool altitude theorem for uh, colon ideals. And furthermore, R mod K is called Macaulay. So this is a rather surprising result. And the way this observation comes in is one can reduce uh, residual intersections to links, but on links, on residual intersections of smaller co-dimension. But those will not be Gornstein anymore, even if the original ambient ring is Gornstein. But by induction, they are Cormicoli. So one has to do linkage in Cormicoli rings, and what saves the day is the strong Cormicoli assumption. Because even if you're only in a Cormicoli ring, the link will remain Cormicoli if the original ideal is stronger than Cormicoli, namely strongly Cormicoli. And that was the key observation. There, were previous, there was a previous result by Art and Nagata, uh, but it was not correct. And Craig observed that Kozul homology comes in or comes to help here. Um, Okay, so let's go back to Ries rings and establish a connection between Ries rings and residual intersections. Uh, so let's look at an ideal, these are without any assumptions really. Let's look at this ideal, uh, I, it's generated by n elements, a1 up to an, and um, 
as an ideal in R, and R is, of course, the degree zero part of the symmetric algebra. But you can think of I also as a degree one part of the symmetric algebra. And then I denote the generators by A1 prime up to An prime. And then one can form what's called the extended symmetric algebra. And it's called sim I a joint T inverse. This makes no sense. It's just a symbol. You can think of it as a T inverse. But what it is, it's just a symmetric algebra a joint available modulo all the relations that tell you that you can get from the A primes to the A's by multiplying with U. So this is why the U works like a T inverse. Okay. And this extended symmetric algebra maps onto the extended Ries ring, which is R a joint IT comma T inverse. And now the T inverse really does make sense in the Laurent polynomial ring, and the U goes to T inverse. There's always this surjection. And now Craig, and that's the crucial connection to residual intersections, proved that if I has positive height and is G infinity, so this just this condition on the local number of genres, no depth condition on Kozul homology or, so, or anything like this, then the, this extended symmetric algebra is defined by an ideal K so we can write it as a polynomial ring, modulo, an ideal K, which is an n residual intersection of the original ideal, not quite, but of the original ideal together with this variable. So the defining ideal of the extended symmetric algebra is a residual intersection of the original ideal. And this gives a very tight connection between residual intersections and uh, Ries rings or extended symmetric algebras and so on. And let me give an application of this, which follows immediately from his work. Uh, now assume, again, R is called Macaulay, the height is positive, and now throw in the stronger condition that I is strongly called Macaulay and G infinity. Then, under these assumptions, because of G infinity, we know that the extended symmetric algebra is defined by a residual intersection. By the previous theorem of Craig, because we have strongly called Macaulay and G infinity, we know that residual intersections are called Macaulay. So therefore, the extended symmetric algebra is called Macaulay. Since the extended algebra is called Macaulay, um, one can uh, quite easily also prove that it is equal to the Ries algebra because one, it's enough to check this equality at associate primes. If one has called Macaulay, one has control over associate primes. So one gets this equality. But then also the associate credit ring is called Macaulay because it's simply extended Ries ring modulo a principal ideal. And from that, again, uh, one also gets that the symmetric algebra is isomorphic to the Ries algebra, and it is called Macaulay. Okay. Of, uh, this uh, isomorphism, of course, the first isomorphism immediately implies the second isomorphism. And the core macaulay simply comes, again, if you want, from Chung Ikeda, since the associate grade ring is core macaulay the Ries ring is core macaulay in this case. Okay. So one can completely recover this result uh, by uh, Herzog, Siemens, Vasconcelo, simply from residual intersections. Okay? And this sets up this connection between uh, Ries rings and residual intersections. In this setting where we have G infinity, if we don't have G infinity, uh, this connection is less apparent, but still is there and is used a lot. So, and that's, that's a very important uh, insight that came from Craig's work. Uh, <clears throat> now, so we've talked about these rings with the G infinity condition of the idea. Of course, the problem is that if the ring is local, then G infinity implies in particular that the number of generators is bounded above by the dimension of the ring. So that's, of course, a strong restriction. Uh, it's a restriction on the number of generators. That's something we don't want. Of course, without that restriction, you cannot expect that the symmetric algebra and the Ries algebra are isomorphic, but one still wants that perhaps the Ries algebra is core Macaulay without being isomorphic to the symmetric algebra. And <clears throat> Greg, together with Sam Huckabar, were the first to treat systematically the case of ideals that have arbitrary number of generators and are not integral over parameter ideals. So that's, uh, that's a very uh, huge step into a new direction of uh, considering algebraic properties of Ries rings. And as I said, the problem is that the number of generators of the ideal I is too large. So what you do, you pass to an ideal which has smaller number of generators, but still is very connected 
to the ideal, and that's the minimal reduction of an ideal. So we have to talk about reductions and integral dependence of ideals. So one says that I is integral over J. J is a sub-ideal of I. We are in a Noetherian local ring with infinite residue field. I is integral over J, or equivalently, J is a reduction of I in some sense. That's just different language. If and only if the induced inclusion of Ries rings is an integral extension of rings in the usual sense. And if you read this fact degree by degree, you get this condition, namely that the r plus first power of the larger ideal is obtained from the rth power of the smaller, uh, of rth power of the larger ideal times one power of the smaller ideal, eventually, for all r. And the smallest such r where this works is called the reduction number of i with respect to j, and it is written in this way. Okay. Uh, so in some sense, um, reduction is a simplification of the ideal, and the reduction number measures how far the two ideals are apart from each other. And then one wants to look at minimal reductions. A reduction is called minimal if it is minimal with respect to inclusion. They always exist by um, work of um, Northcott and Ries. And another definition, the analytic spread actually came up in, in Dale's talk already, analytic spread even of filtrations. This is just the analytic spread of iatic filtrations. The analytic spread of i is the minimal number of generators of j for any minimal reduction of i. So minimal reductions are highly non-unique, but they all share the same minimal number of generators. And that's because this invariant can also be defined as the Krull dimension of the special fiber ring, the Ries ring tensored with K. So that's a special fiber over the close point uh, inside the blow up, the broach of the Ries ring, the blow up of spec R along V of I. Okay? And from this definition, it's clear uh, that the analytic spread is bounded above First of all, by the dimension of R, but also by the minimum number of generators of I. And it's bounded below by the height of I because um, I and the minimum reduction, they have the same radical. Okay? So therefore, the height of I is the height of J, and L of I is the number of generators of J. So simply use Krull's altitude theorem. Okay? But now here we are. Now we have a new ideal J, which satisfies this condition uh, we didn't have before, namely that the number of generators is bounded above by the dimension of the ring. So if I replace I by J, then the number of generators is bounded above by the dimension of the ring R. So one could maybe hope one has some information about the Ries ring of J and then goes back to R if the reduction number is small enough. And in fact, uh, Greg and Sam were able to implement that. So write G for the height of I and L for the analytic spread. And if the analytic spread is, as I said, it's at least G, if it's equal to G, the case is kind of trivial, well understood. Uh, but if not, the first case to consider is the case where the difference between L and G is at most one or equal to one. That's called uh, analytic deviation one. And in that case, they prove what one would like to have. Again, the assumptions are uh, R is a Cormacaulay ring. Uh, let me go to, to the next, uh, sorry. R is a core Macaulay ring. R mod I is almost core Macaulay, means at either the depth is the dimension or at most one worse. The height is at least one. I is a complete intersection, local in co dimension, G plus one. And L, that's the crucial assumption, is at most G plus one. And then the reduction number of I with respect to some minimal reduction is at most one. And from that, they get that the Ries ring and the associated credit ring are core Macaulay. So, but notice there is no condition on the number of generators of the ideal I. And they have a similar result uh, for G plus two. One has to strengthen the conditions a little bit, uh, but that's what they prove. Um, now, I should say that meanwhile, uh, this, has, th this, this generated a lot of activities in the first half of the 90s. Many people worked on this, and uh, the, 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 eventually the case of arbitrary analytic spread was solved, and the, Proofs were different and so on. Uh, but the main point is that, again, uh, Craig and in this case with Sam, they were at the 
at the foundation of this, they, they were the first ones who started to say, maybe people never would have picked up this or dared to pick up this problem. I mean, their proof is very, very complicated, you see, but things got much simpler as time went on, but that's not the point. I mean, they were the, point, the ones that started this. And, of course, in general, uh, one has to um, impose conditions on the reduction number. One has to also impose some conditions on depths of powers or Kozul homology. Uh, one just doesn't get away with these basic conditions. And, uh, but, but still, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is the way it went. Uh, in both cases, also interesting to observe that J colon I is a residual intersection. So there is, again, this connection still to the residual intersection, although the, the proofs don't uh, go quite directly in terms of translation from one to the other. Okay, uh, let me now also talk briefly about the core. I had mentioned that, um, in general, uh, minimal reductions are highly non-unique, and to remedy this, one looks at the intersection of all reductions. That's called the core of an ideal. So we are in a Nuthian local ring, infinite residue field, I is an idea, then the core of I is the intersection of all reductions is enough to look at all minimal reductions. Um, and this was introduced by um, uh, Judy Sally and Ries, uh, Ries and Sally. And uh, <clears throat> it also comes up naturally in the Prionson Skoda theorem, I'll get back to this later. If I is regular, then uh, I raised to the power L of I, the analytical spread is actually contained in the core, so that's a lower bound for the core. But in general, the core is an a priori infinite intersection, and it's very hard to compute or understand. And the first, again, uh, to find a formula, very explicit formula for the core, where Craig, together with Irena Swanson, uh, this is now in a two-dimensional regular ring, I is an integrally closed ideal, so we have the Sariski theory of integrally closed ideals in regular rings, and then they prove that the core of I is I times the second fitting ideal, or J squared colon I. So the core, which is an infinite a priori intersection of ideals, well, in this case, not, uh, but in general, it could be an infinite intersection, uh, then <coughs> can be expressed in terms of a single reduction. J is a single reduction. J is a sing one minimal reduction. Again, uh, this was vastly generalized, but uh, this is really the, the, the ground floor. So, uh, so that's a very, very, very it's also very diff not an easy proof at all. Uh, so now let me pass to the other topic, namely uniformity. So, um, Uniformity in Euthian rings. So here's a quote from Craig Kuneke. Behind the obvious finiteness condition in Euthian rings, there lie many deeper and hidden types of finiteness which come to light in terms of uniform behavior. Okay. So one way to think of uniform behavior is that, it's, that uniform means uniform for every ideal I in a given Euthian ring R. So I fix the ring R, but I want uniform behavior for all ideals, or study what uniform properties do all ideals have. And a typical example, and one that also inspired Craig, as far as I understand, is the following. Suppose we are in prime characteristic, then a test element from tight closure theory has such a uniform property, namely it multiplies the tight closure of any ideal into the ideal. Okay. So in other words, it's a uniform annihilator of the module I star modulo I, regardless of what I is. And that uniformity plays a very important role in tight closure theory. Um, here I will focus on Craig's work on uniformity related to Artin Ries, to the Artin Ries theorem integral closure filtrations, and symbolic power filtrations. Okay? So let me explain this. What is the prionson skoda theorem? Well, here's the prionson skoda theorem, uh, proved by prionson skoda with analytic methods. And the first algebraic proof and the general algebraic formulation is due to Lippmann and Sade. So assume as a regular domain of dimension D, finite, then what the prionson skoda theorem does, it compares the integral closure filtration with the iadic filtration in a uniform 
way and in a very tight way. Okay? And what it says is that the integral closure of uh, I n is contained in I n minus a constant, namely minus d plus 1. So that's I'm adding or subtracting uh, an integer, and I get this contained. So it's a very um, tight connection between the two filtrations. But the point also is that this constant I'm co adding or, cons or subtracting is independent of the ideal i. So it's a uniform constant. So that's a uniform behavior. Now, uh, one way to think of this, and that's the way they proved it, actually, is that this is simply a statement about the conductor of the extended Ries algebra. It simply says that the element t to the 1 minus t is in the conductor of the extended Ries algebra. Okay? And then the way the proof goes is when we would just have to approximate the conductor from below, one has to show that this particular element is in there. And the way they do that is that they show very generally that a Jacobian ideal is in the conductor. Okay? And that's, of course, generalizing very classical results that's unknown algebraic number theory, also in four rings, uh, for affine K algebras by Amy Noether and so on. This was all known. But of course, they need this in much greater generality. And that's what they prove, and that's how the proof goes. Um, now, one cannot expect this to be true uh, if the ring is not regular, because, for instance, if d is 1 in the one-dimensional case, uh, this inclusion would say that all ideals are integrally closed, but then the ring is regular. Okay? So that doesn't work. However, in the one-dimensional case, um, you also have that you have the conductor ideal, say if you're in a local case, and then any non-zero ideal, say if you're in a domain, every non-zero ideal contains or if you have an M primary ideal or an ideal which is not the whole ring, uh, then a power of that ideal is always contained in the conductor of the ring. Okay? And from that alone, you would get some kind of a uniform condition like this. It wouldn't be the D minus 1 or 1 minus D, but it would still be uniform. Okay? So one could expect possibly that a uniform result of this type works. And, but of course, before that, uh, one should see why, in general, such a result at all could work, even if I fix the ideal i. Okay? And it doesn't work in general, that's a result of Ries, but it does work if the ring is analytically unramified. So if the ring is analytically unramified, then for every ideal, there exists a k so that i n bar is contained in i to the n minus k. Okay? So that's simply the fact that in this case, the integral closure of the extended Ries ring is finitely generated over the extended Ries ring. Okay? And that's guaranteed by Ries if R is analytically unramified. Analytically unramified means the ring is local and the completion is reduced. But he also showed that the converse holds. If this inclusion holds for a single M primary ideal, then the ring has to be analytically unramified. So that's the weakest condition you can impose. Okay? But of course, now the next step is assuming analytically unramified, can you choose this k uniformly. Okay? And Craig calls this uniform Brionson Skoda. Uniform Brionson Skoda holds in R if that k can be chosen uniformly. And he conjectures that uniform Brionson Skoda holds in any excellent ring of finite dimension. Okay? So, and that's a very vast conjecture. And he essentially proved it. So, uh, now this is related. There's another. Uh, uh, uniformity type of result, that's the uniform artin ries theorem. So let me quickly explain this. So uh, n in M is an inclusion of new theory and R modules. Then the artin ries theorem says that there exists a K so that uh, this intersection property holds. Uh, so simply that says, if I look at the iadic filtration on M and I restrict it to the submodel, it's of course not an iadic filtration anymore, but it's still, at least it's I-stable. So that's the artin ries theorem, and which is used all over the place. Um, now, what about, um, sorry, this is a typo. Uh, I shouldn't have said it. Um, sorry. Uh, Uniform art in Ries, of course, what one wants is that the K doesn't depend on I, but one wants not this equality, one just wants the inclusion that I intersect, I N intersected, I M intersected N is contained in 
IKM intersected with N. The equality, one doesn't require. That's the containment that the left is in the right uh, without the, the, uh, the, uh, this, this north. So what one wants is, I, I, should, I should write it, sorry. What one wants is that uh, the left-hand side is an I to the um, N minus K times uh, M. That's, that's the point. N, N. Sorry. That's it. Sorry. Um, which, of course, holds so again, I to the N. N. Right. So that's, that's, that's the crucial, crucial container. That's the one that's used. And that's uniform art in Ries. And Here's the theorem, which, and then Craig also conjectured that uniform art in Ries holds uh, for any excellent uh, ring of finite cold dimension. And he essentially proved this. So that's the, the theorem, amazing theorem. Uh, it says that uniform pre coda and uniform art in Ries hold in any reduced Neuthian ring R satisfying either of these conditions, either are uh, as essential finite type over an excellent local ring or over Z, or R has prime characteristic and is F finite. Okay? And the reduced and excellent condition is only used for the Prionson Skoda theorem, not for the Artin Ries, uniform Artin Ries. Okay? And notice what separates this from the completely general case is that in the first bullet point, the ring is supposed to be local. If that wouldn't be there, that would be the general. But it's very close to being general. Um, so let me quickly outline the proof just to give an idea how these things are related. Uh, the proof of these two uniformity properties, Brunson's code and Artin Ries, are intertwined and use two other uniform properties. Uh, and the first one, I just call them uniform conductor elements uh, because that should really remind you of the proof of the Brunson Skoda theorem because it relates to conductors. And what you want in the end is to find uniform conductor elements for extended Ries rings, regardless of the idea. Okay? So, and this simply means there exists a K and an element C in R naught. R naught, this is a notation from tight closure theory. It's a set of all elements which are not in any minimal prime, so that that fixed C times the integral closure of i to the n is contained in i to the n minus k for every ideal i. Again, this should be uniform. Or equivalently, there exists, that's essentially what it says, there exists an element in the conductor of the extended Ries ring of degree minus k. And except one doesn't take the conductor with respect to the integral closure, one just takes the integral closure inside the Laurent polynomial ring because R is not assumed to be normal. Okay? So that's this uniform conductor condition. But the point is that this should hold for every ideal. Okay? Now there is another condition, another uniformity condition, uh, that's uniform annihilation of cohomology, of homology, and it says there exists an element D again in R naught that annihilates the positive degree homology for every bounded complex of finite free R models that satisfy the books from Eisen but acyclicity conditions with grade replaced by height. Okay? And so such complexes, of course, are not acyclic because in the books from Eisenbart criterion, you need grade, not height. But those are the complexes that would be acyclic if the ring were Cormacaulay. So this takes care of rings that are not called Macaulay. And well, with that, the proof, Craig's proof works like this. If you have these conditions, A and B, not just for R, but R modulo P for every prime ideal, then he shows that uniform art in Ries holds for the ring. So the uniform art in Ries for the ring follows from these two conditions, where the first condition, A, this uniform uh, conductor condition very much smells like the art in Ries theorem. It smells like the, the, the Prionson Skoda theorem. Okay? So that's, that's the connection in some sense. Uh, Prionson Skoda sort of implies art in Ries, I mean, very roughly speaking. And the proof is a 
induction on the dimension of m modulo n, it's, it's rather involved. Okay? But that's the connection. And the other connection, so how do we get a uniform Brillouin-Sans coda? If we have condition A and uniform RT in Ries, then uniform Brillouin-Sans coda holds. And this is how everything is connected. The four uniformity properties are very much connected. And that proof, at least I can show, this is really very clear and easy. So for every idea we have, that c times the integral closure of i n is in i to the n minus k. That's simply by part a. But this ideal is also in the principal ideal generated by c. So therefore, I can intersect with cr. And this works by a and for every i without any uh, restriction on i uniformly. Uh, but then I can use, this is now a condition that looks like, like uniform art in Ries, this version here, and we apply this to the case where M is the ring and N is the ideal generated by C, and then we get uh, that this intersection is in C times I to the N minus K minus some K prime and by uniform art in Ries, and now cancel the C, C is a non-zero divisor, and you get uniform Briançon score. So this condition A together with uniform art in Ries implies uniform Briançon scholar. Okay? Um, that's, uh, that's what I want to say about uniformity. Let me pass to symbolic powers. Again, I'll come back to uniformity at the end of that. Uh, but of course, symbolic powers, that's also uh, a case where one wants to look at symbolic proper, uh, on uniform properties. Uh, so R is a Neuthian ring, I is an ideal, uh, W is the complement of the union of the associated primes, and then the nth symbolic power is the extension of the nth power to the localization contracted to the ring. Now with this definition, the first symbolic power is the ideal itself. Okay, of course there's a difference whether one takes its associate primes or minimal primes. And it contains always the nth power. Okay? Uh, now, symbolic powers have appeared since long in commutative algebra. For instance, they played a crucial role in Kohl's original proof of the Kohl altitude theorem. They have a geometric meaning. For instance, if R is a polynomial ring over a field and I is radical, then the nth symbolic power is the intersection of m to the n, where m is any maximal ideal in V of I, okay? And this, of course, is a set of all polynomials that vanish to order N at each closed point of V of I, okay? Uh, in general, though, symbolic powers are difficult to compute, difficult to understand, also difficult to understand how they relate to powers, okay? And, of course, the simplest uh, question, well, not the simplest, but the most basic question one could ask, the best one could hope for, is when are symbolic powers equal to powers? And uh, there is a, a nice observation by Craig uh, that if this holds, say, suppose there are no embedded associate primes, then this implies that locally at every non-minimal prime, the analytic spread is strictly less than the height of the prime. So that means the analytic spread cannot be maximal. The analytic spread is always less or equal to the height of the prime, but the equality has to be strict. So that's a very strong condition. Uh, and interestingly, and that's together with David Eisen, but the converse holds if the associate graded ring is called Macaulay. Okay? So what this says is that if one knows that the associate graded ring is called Macaulay, then this condition on the analytic spread alone, which is easy to check, implies that the powers and the symbolic powers are the same. And since Craig proved a lot of results about Macaulay-ness of associate graded rings, he thereby also proved a lot of results about the equality of symbolic powers and powers. That's just this necessary condition you have to check. And if it's satisfied, the powers and the symbolic powers are the same. Now, if R is an excellent domain, then he also observed that if one simply has this strong condition on the symbolic, on the analytic spread alone, uh, one can conclude that the symbolic Ries ring which is the direct sum of all the symbolic powers, is a Neuthian ring. Okay? 
So it's not necessarily equal to the Ries ring, but it's at least a Noetherian ring. In fact, it's even a Noetherian model over the Ries ring. That's even stronger, okay? So that's uh, one condition one gets. And he, in general, he has a lot of work um, on when this symbolic Ries ring is called Macaulay without this strong condition on the analytic spread. And that is interesting because, uh, for instance, if we are in a Noetherian local ring and I is a one-dimensional prime ideal, then the Noetherianness of the symbolic Ries ring implies that the ideal is a set so at a complete intersection. And we had talks about this. So for some time, this was a very uh, active uh, subject, and Craig contributed greatly to that. Now, um, so that's this question, when the symbolic algebra is Noetherian in general makes sense. Um, and what I said, uh, it implies set theoretic complete intersection in the one dimension case. Now, in general, okay, powers and symbolic powers are not the same. The best one could hope for is a comparison in perhaps a uniform comparison between ordinary and symbolic powers. And uh, there was a result by um, Ein, um, Lazarsfeld, and Smith, which gave a very tight uniform comparison between powers and symbolic powers uh, for reduced ideals in regular rings, essential finite type over a field of characteristic zero, and this result, and they used um, asymptotic multiplier ideals, and this result was greatly generalized by Hawks and Unicke to the case of any uh, regular ring containing a field, for instance. And they also treat the case uh, where the ring is not regular. And here's the statement. So R is a Noetherian ring containing a field. I is an ideal, and H is the maximal height of an associate prime of I. If R is regular, then uh, this symbolic power of i to the hn is contained in i to the n. So again, a very tight bound. So it says in particular that the symbolic topology and the ideal adic topology are linearly equivalent, but that this factor h is actually uniform. Okay? It's only uh, can be bounded, for instance, by the dimension of the ring, if the dimension of the ring is finite. Okay. And of course, one, can, one has to take at least something like, like a, a linear function where the, the coefficient of n is not 1, because if, as before, you would just take uh, n plus a constant, that wouldn't work, because it would imply the symbolic Ries ring to be integral over the Ries ring, and then uh, this would that's a very special case. So in general, one cannot expect that. So this H has to be uh, at least, uh, so, so N plus a constant would not work. Okay? So it has to take at least uh, a constant times N. So that's um, the, the gist of it. That's the best one could expect for. And if the ring is not necessarily um, regular, but you're in a setting where you can talk about a Jacobian ideal, then if you multiply the left-hand side with the n plus first power of that Jacobian ideal, you still have the containment, okay? And the proof is via reduction to prime characteristic, and there they show that uh, the nth power of the Jacobian ideal times that symbolic power is contained not in i to the n, but in the tight closure of i to the n. Okay. And that immediately gives the case of the regular ring, because in the regular ring, the Jacobian ideal is the unit ideal, and the tight closure of any ideal is the ideal, so that does it. And for two, one uses that the Jacobian ideal can be generated by completely stable test elements, which means that if we multiply this inclusion by J, then the right-hand side is actually contained in I to the N, and that, that finishes the proof. Um, well, maybe I skip uh, this and go immediately to the uh, uniformity questions. Um, so again, this is uh, the simplest version of the unique Rockstar theorem. R is a regular ring containing a field of finite, and the ring has uh, dimension d, which is finite, then i to the uh, symbolic power dn is contained in in for every i. So that's the uniformity. So this, this d, this coefficient, only depends on, um, on, the, on the ring, not on the idea. That's simply because uh, whatever this h was in the previous theorem is always bounded by the dimension of the ring. 
And the question then is, can one generalize this to things which are not regular? Uh, and just forgetting even about uniformity, one could ask, is there such a constant K for a given idea so that this inclusion holds? So that is sort of the anal analog of the Ries theorem, but now for the uh, in, uh, symbolic power filtrations. And indeed, that's true by, by the side of Swanson. For instance, if R is normal and excellent, then that can be done. Okay. And then the question, of course, is when can one choose this K uniformly? And this is a theorem of Unicky, Katz, and Validashti, and they prove indeed one can. And the main condition here is that the ring has an isolated singularity. That's the restricting condition. So R is analytically irreducible, Nuthia and local, and it has an isolated singularity. And then two conditions that should remind you of something I said before. R is essentially of type, finite type, over a field of characteristic zero, or R has prime characteristic and is F finite. And then indeed, there exists a uniform K so that the Kth symbolic power is contained, the nth power, for every prime ideal at least. Okay? Um, so the proof uses, and that's why these assumptions look familiar, uses uh, the two uniformity uh, results I mentioned before, the uniform Prionson Skoda and the uniform Artin Ries, which hold in this case by the previous theorems. But it also requires new uniform versions of Chevrolet's theorem and many other things. And uh, this is still an open problem in general, but Craig and uh, lately with, with Dan Katz, they have done work. They considered, for instance, uh, finite abelian extensions of regular rings, and under suitable additional conditions, um, there they can still do that. Um, I think I had some more things, uh, but maybe it's better to stop at this point. The question or comment? Where the main thing is that you, you just need basically that the integral closure is a finite module. That's, yeah. It's again, excellent is a little bit overkill, but, but you know, that's, that's what you need. Any other questions or comments or from any of the people on Zoom? Um, just thank you, Bernd, for oh, uh, yeah. such a nice talk. I shouldn't say nice since it's about my work, but I sure it is. That's why it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, there you thank are. Thank you. Good, good, good to see Thanks you. For, that was uh, one of my great pleasures was working with Bernd for so many years, and as he said, it's like we can pick up where we left off any time. It's a wonderful thing to have a collaborator. With. So thank you, Bernd. Thank you, Craig. Craig, thank you. So many years of pleasure, pleasurable work. Let, let's uh, thank Bern and Craig also for the comments. <laughs>